Good morning, and welcome to the Tuesday, March 15th, 2022 meeting of the House Education Finance Committee. Remote hearings are held in accordance with House Rule 10.01. This rule has been posted online and is linked to in our public meeting notice on the House website. All remote hearings will be recorded and live streamed by House Public Information Services. Members have the contents of their virtual packets available to them, and for the public, these same materials have been posted online. Members, if you're looking for all these items in one place, they are attached to the calendar event you have that Ms. Burt sent for today. To get on the list to be recognized by the chair, members using the Zoom interface have the ability to raise their hands via the app. Ms. Burt will place your name on the list to be recognized. The committee legislative assistant will now take an oral roll call of the members. Mr. Lee? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, roll call commence now. Chair Davi? Present. Representative Sandstead? Present. Representative Kresha? Kresha, present. Representative Bennett? Present. Representative Daniels? Here. Representative Damith? Present. Representative Drafkowski? Present. Representative Erickson? Erickson, present. Representative Feist? Present. Representative Jordan? Present. Representative Marcourt? Marcourt, present. Representative Mueller? Mueller, present. Representative Richardson? Present. Representative Thompson? Thompson, present. Representative Walgamot? Walgamot, present. Representative Shung? Present. Representative Joaquim? Representative Joaquim? All right, Mr. Chair, we have quorum. Thank you very much, Mr. Lee. Representative Daniels, have you had the opportun opportunity, excuse me, to review the minutes from Thursday, March 10th? And if so, would you like to move approval of those minutes? Yes, Chair, I have looked at the minutes and I vote for approval of the minutes. Thank you very much. Any discussion to the Daniels motion? Seeing none, members, this is a voice vote. If you'd please unmute. All those in favor of the Daniels motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Nay? Motion prevails. Thank you, Representative Daniels. Members, our first bill presentation is from Representative Berg with a bill that will establish student support personnel aid. It's our intention to lay this bill over for further consideration and possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill by 11 a.m. Representative Feist, would you like to make a motion to move House File 1742 before the committee to lay it over for further consideration and possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill? Yes, Mr. Chair, so moved. Thank you very much. Representative Berg, welcome. Before you introduce your bill, I understand that you have an author's amendment you'd like to offer to get the bill in the shape that you'd prefer. I'll move the DE1 amendment to be before the committee to put the bill in the shape that Representative Berg desires. Representative Berg, can you tell us a bit about your amendment, please? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. This is a DE1 amendment. It contains a number of small technical corrections brought forward by the school nurses, school social workers, school psychologists, and school counselors to better reflect their professions. For example, we are adding the words physical health at 1.17 because we know the link between physical and mental health and well-being. There is also new language at 2.27 defining what we mean when we say unfilled position. The most significant change in the bill is that we are increasing the investment in this bill to 250 million. Our students' mental and physical health needs are at an all-time high. And thankfully, we have a surplus of over $9 billion. We have the resources to meet their needs. With this investment, we can make sure over 3,000 school counselors, school nurses, school psychologists, and social workers are working with our children. Thank you. Any discussion uh, to the chair's motion for the DE1 author's amendment? Seeing none members, another voice vote. If you'd please unmute. All those in favor of approving the author's amendment to DE1, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay? Motion prevails. Representative Berg, to your bill as amended. Any further comments? Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Yes, 
This pandemic has weighed heavily on all of us, changing nearly all of our daily interactions. And of course, the unavoidable isolation. But it has affected the lives of our educators, parents, and students who embarked on distance learning this whole new thing to all of us um, in ways that we're still learning about. Over the past year, students, parents, and educators, and legislators have learned to adjust to the shift, but several realities have become clear. Our students need more support, mental health, physical health, and social emotional supports. This bill would provide ongoing sustainable funding to every school district and charter school in Minnesota to allow schools to prioritize these supports. Districts would receive dedicated funding of at least $35,000 or 235 per pupil, which is, which is higher to hire a school nurse, school counselors, chemical dependency counselors, social workers, and or psychologists. Minnesota has 6,000 fewer school counselors, school social workers, nurses, and psychologists than necessary to meet the needs of our students. We know student support personnel close opportunity gaps. Social workers provide the children in need with access to transportation, academic supports, counseling, basic nutrition, and in some cases, they help find students housing. School nurses are often the only medical professionals a student will see for months. Nurses educate students on allergies, mental health, hygiene, and emotional regulation. School counselors and psychologists provide education on social emotional learning through a racial justice lens. I have had so many conversations with my constituents about the need to have school counselors in every building. Many of you know the story of my struggles with my own son throughout his educational experience, resulting in high anxiety due to feeling less than the other students. Why is he so dumb? Why can't he do the work other students can do? Resulting in anxiety and depression even into young adulthood. We know that school counselors provide comprehensive support throughout the school, both to students as well as staff. They focus on social emotional support, academic support, and career support, both individually or in groups. This is the focus of my community, but I know other communities might face different needs. They might need the more intensive supports offered by school social workers or psychologists. They may need to expand or even hire their very first school nurse to meet the increasing challenges of our medically complex students. This is why the bill provides local control to hire the student support personnel most needed in their community. Mr. Chair and members, I have a number of testifiers with me today. I'll yield my time to them. Thank you very much, Representative Berg, for that introduction. I do have a list of testifiers. First on that list is Dee Dee Savanich, a registered nurse, nurse with the Osseo Public Schools. Ms. Savanich, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Thank you. My name is Dee Dee Savanich. I have been a registered nurse for 14 years and a high school nurse for the last eight. School nurses do so much more than hand out ice packs and Band-Aids. During the eight years in my building, I have watched the acuity of my student body increase year after year, both general education students and special education alike. My first year, I had 66 students who needed emergency health plans for things like diabetes, seizure disorders, cancers, severe allergies, and asthma, et cetera. Now, my school has over 170 students who need an emergency health plan. As more premature babies survive infancy, we are going to see more and more students require special services and have lifelong health concerns. Each year, I respond to more chemical abuse events than the previous year. The mental health emergencies and suicide attempts at school increase each year. The nurse is often the first person that students seek when they experience mental health concerns because they say they have a stomach ache that's anxiety. They have a headache that's stress the student who can't breathe, who is experiencing a panic attack. We need at least one nurse in each school building to be able to provide the care our students need. Being a kid these days is completely different than it was 20 years ago, let alone 40 years ago. Many of the stressors our youth deal with today are unlike anything we dealt with as kids. 
adding electronic devices and the vast influence of social media to the general stress of being a teenager contribute to the rise of mental health issues. I can't even begin to count how many of our students must work to contribute to pay, to pay rent or help pay for groceries. Additionally, our medical community and society in general are more aware of the importance of mental health care. Even before COVID-19, K through 12 students needed more counselors, psychologists, nurses, and social workers in every school. But school boards across the state say they don't have the funds to provide these services. Our students are our future and we need to invest in our youth. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Savanich. Next, Liz Zeno, a licensed school nurse. Please uh, state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Liz Zeno. I'm here representing the School Nurse Organization of Minnesota. I've been a school nurse in Minneapolis for 29 years. We join our colleagues in support of the increase in funding for student support personnel positions in this bill. The licensed school nurse or LSN is a registered nurse certified in public health through the Board of Nursing and licensed as a school nurse through the Department of Education. LSNs address physical and mental health issues of students. Every child comes to school and they bring with them every kind of health condition that kids have. Alongside our colleagues, school nurses have an important role in supporting students' mental health. It's been estimated that school nurses spend approximately a third of their time providing mental health services. We don't know the exact LSN to student ratios because the MDE does not collect that information, but we conservatively believe it to be about one to every 1400 students across the state. Based on the little data that we can gather, it appears that up to two thirds of Minnesota schools do not have an LSN, no matter whether urban, suburban or rural. Who is looking after all those students with health conditions? Who is providing guidance to those schools? This connects to our support for the permanent position for an LSN at the MDE. There was an LSN at the MDE until about six years ago. Since then, districts large and small have greatly missed the opportunity to consult with a school nurse expert regarding a range of issues like special education, medications at school, and most recently, the pandemic. This state guidance is a necessity for our LSNs, health assistants, and especially those schools and districts who do not have an LSN. We're grateful the MDE used federal funds to create a position for an LSN at the MDE, but it's only through October of 2024. The bill before you would provide funding to make that position permanent. We strongly support that provision. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Ms. Zeno. Next, Maureen Hudicek, a psychologist with the Prior Lake Savage School District. Ms. Hudicek, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. I'm Maureen Hudicek, and as mentioned, I work at Prior Lake High School, although in my 19 years, I've worked K through post-secondary education. The aid for student support personnel is vital to ensure that school psychologists like me serve within the scope and practice of their training and licensure. Our, straight, our state's shortages of school psychologists have led to a narrow understanding of our training. School psychologists are uniquely positioned to, bring, to meet the broader needs of students, families, and staff. Our expertise with intervention, collaboration, social emotional learning, crisis preparedness, as well as response to um, positive school climate, climate are skills that our schools desperately need now more than ever. If we're to engage in prevention as opposed to our current wait to fail model, we would save districts thousands of dollars and reduce yearly labor demands. Helping struggling students before they're referred for special education improves students' performance earlier, increases parent satisfaction, assists teachers by giving them back their time for class-wide instruction, and reduces our overwhelming need for special education resources that results in our cross-subsidy. Another benefit of this bill is to fully integrate learning supports, instruction, and school management with a comprehensive approach of interdisciplinary collaboration. With training in all components of learning, school psychologists can identify patterns in the student's performance and use the science of learning to, to determine research-backed supports. Offering a continuum of intervention utilizes the experience, expertise of student support personnel would result in higher efficacy and academic gains. 
For school psychologists, pulling all this information together is standard practice. However, because of our current shortages, our ability to attend to the students' needs in this manner is too often non-existent. With the present volume of testing and report writing that I'm required to do to meet legal timelines for special education, the time I have left to engage in prevention is heavily compromised, and it is students and families that suffer the most. We have the expertise and we know how to help. We're simply asking for the capacity to meet the needs of our students. With this bill, adding positions dedicated to the practice of an integrated intervention approach will improve outcomes, increase satisfaction, and reduce stress for students, families, and teachers. I appreciate your time and consideration. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hudacek. Next, Keila Coolers, school counselor at the St. Paul Music Academy. Ms. Coolers, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Uh, dear members, my name is Keila Coolers. I am the 2022 Minnesota State School Counselor of the Year, currently working in an elementary school in St. Paul and the parent of a kindergartner who attends a Minnesota public school. Two weeks ago, I testified to Ed Policy about my choice as a parent to enroll my child in a neighboring school district because, like too many in the state of Minnesota, our home district does not have elementary school counseling. And I make this choice solely because I know the indelible impacts elementary school counselors have, not just on individual students, but on the whole learning environment. The timing to improve school counselor to student ratios in Minnesota could not be more crucial as we continue to navigate out of the pandemic's ripple effect on student learning and mental health. Students need access to school counselors to build mindsets to believe in themselves and strategies to be successful learners. Like the group of kindergartners that I see on Wednesday mornings who are learning strategies to work through big emotions and skills to play cooperatively with others. Classrooms need school counselors for lessons that build even more realness and engage students into their education. Like the classroom lesson that I'll give to fourth grade students today, where we will research a career interest and explore what school subjects they are learning and that are used in that work. Teachers and school communities need access to school counselors for consultation and professional development. Like the meeting I had with a first grade teacher yesterday, where we developed a plan to best support a struggling student whose family is experiencing homelessness. Or trainings I have facilitated on educator self-care, mental health early warning signs, or to families on preparing their student for that big middle school transition, to name a few of many. These stories I highlight are not unique to me or my school, nor unique to this moment in time. All Minnesota students and school communities don't just need improved access to school counselors. They deserve it. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Coolers. Last on the list of testifiers, Molly Fox, lead school social worker for the Mankato Area Public Schools. Ms. Fox, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Molly Fox, uh, school social worker, Mankato Area Public Schools. Good morning, Honorable Chairman Dabney and committee members. My name is Molly Fox. I'm the past president of the Minnesota School Social Work Association, and I've been practicing as a social worker for the past 22 years. Pre-COVID research shows that one in four children have been exposed to at least one traumatic event. However, the traumatic events of the past two years, not only resulting from the pandemic, but also the effects of increased racialized violence perpetuated on communities of color, have touched the lives of every individual in varying degrees, including our youngest learners. Exposures to traumatic events like the pandemic, especially during a child's years, can adversely affect a child's sense of security and safety, ability to learn, and can lead to poor outcomes later in adulthood. School social workers like myself have witnessed firsthand over the past two years how unresolved grief and loss, persistent anxiety and fears, have overwhelmed the capacity of our students to cope, impacting their educational experience. I have personally observed increased suicidal ideation, feelings of hopelessness, and the effects of unrelenting anxiety on my students' ability to learn. On behalf of the Minnesota School Social Work Association, I urge you to support House File 1742, which includes critical funding for student support services personnel within Minnesota schools to mitigate the effects of the past two years connected to the pandemic and social inequities. One of the elements of this legislation is not only funding school employed support personnel like school social workers, but also creates a workforce development initiative 
to increase the number of student personnel each year. The value of investing in school employed support personnel like school social workers, school nurses, school psychologists, school counselors, is that we can respond to crisis and needs in the moment because we are embedded in the school community. Students cannot learn if the physical and mental health needs are unmet. Investing now in our children is an investment in their healing and recovery. While the needs are great, school social workers stand ready along with my colleagues today to support our students in every way we can. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you, Ms. Fox. When this hearing was posted, the public was provided with instructions on how to sign up to testify during the public portion of this bill hearing. We received one request for public testimony. Mr. Uni, Government Relations with the Minnesota Department of Education. Mr. Uni, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Mr. Chair, committee members, thank you. My name is Adosh Uni. I am the Director of Government Relations for the Minnesota Department of Education. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of Representative Berg's HF 1742 to fund student support personnel in our districts and charters funding a workforce development pipeline initiative and funding an additional support position at MDE. These proposals or these strategies are also in the, in the governor's bill. School districts and charter schools want their students to be ready for, ready for and succeed at college, work and life. However, school districts are facing many challenges that are limiting their ability to ensure all students can learn and thrive, such as absenteeism, behavior and discipline issues, truancy and dropout. These challenges can often be linked to unmet social, emotional, and physical health needs that can significantly affect students' academic achievement. The COVID-19 pandemic has revealed and exacerbated students' unmet needs. For years, Minnesota has had one of the lowest student to counselor ratios in the country. Um, in, uh, in fiscal year 2017, Minnesota has had just one school counselor for every 659 students. Minnesota's student to counselor ratio is 45% over the national average of 455 students per counselor. Only four states had higher student to counselor ratios than Minnesota. This is just one reason why the strategy in the governor's budget and HF 1742 are so desperately needed. The first strategy would provide funding for additional student support personnel in our districts, charters, intermediates, and co-ops. And this would include counselors, social workers, school psychologists, school nurses, and chemical dependency counselors. But we know that like in so many other fields, we have a workforce shortage. That is why the second strategy of a workforce development pipeline initiative is also crucial. This will allow MDE to lead efforts to increase providers of color, support re-specialization efforts for psychologists and counselors, and enhance recruitment and retention of school mental health providers. All of these strategies would leverage partnerships like with entities like DHS and the U of M. Finally, a dedicated staff member of the department will support these efforts by providing educational leadership, program development, training, consultation, and resources to those in the field. Addressing shortages of student support personnel within Minnesota schools through a multi-pronged approach will decrease caseloads for existing student support services personnel to ensure effective services, ensure that students receive effective academic guidance and integrated and comprehensive services to improve K through 12 outcomes and career college readiness, ensure that student support services personnel serve within the scope and practice of the training and licensure, fully integrate learning supports, instruction, and school management within a comprehensive approach that facilitates interdisciplinary collaboration and improve school safety and school climate to support academic success and career and college readiness. Again, thank you for the opportunity to offer support for increasing student support personnel in our schools to meet the mental health needs of our students. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Rooney. Uh, like to note that Representative Yuakim has joined us. Members, questions for the testifiers or the author? Well, I'll credit the uh, testifiers and the author. Uh, with that, Representative Berg, do you have any closing comments? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Many of you uh, I see on here serve with me in the Education Policy Committee. You've heard me talk about Jake and the struggles that he's had throughout his educational experience. And it wasn't until he got to high school, we had a full-time school counselor assigned to him that changed the course of his um, high school career. Unfortunately, 
that course was just racking up enough credits to pass high school. And what an opportunity lost of a bright young mind. This bill would help assure that so many struggles like Jake's and the conversations I'm having in my community um, with much worse and much different experiences are lessened. Members, I urge you to support this bill. Our children are not okay, and we have the opportunity to help. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Burke. And with that, Representative Feist renews her motion to lay over House File 1742 as amended for possible inclusion or further consideration at a later date. Representative Berg, thanks for joining us today. Thank you to the testifiers. For our next bill hearing, we have House File 3634 from Representative Morrison. Members, it is our intention to take action on this bill by 1130 a.m. Representative Joachim, would you like to make a motion to move House File 3634 before the committee and to refer it to the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee? Yes, Mr. Chair, I'll move that House File 3634 come before the committee with the thought of moving it to the Judiciary Committee. Thank you very much, and we'll move that thought to a vote later. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Representative Morrison, before you introduce your bill, I understand you have an author's amendment you'd like to offer to get the bill into the shape you'd prefer. The chair will move the A3 amendment to be before the committee to put the bill in the shape that she desires. Representative Morrison, would you like to describe the A3 amendment for us, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the A3 amendment is the result of feedback and suggestions from NAMI, disability advocates, mental health professionals, educators, and fellow lawmakers. So first, it explicitly states that the mental health screening tool that is utilized will be evidence-based. Second, it states that the parent must be notified prior to a screening and the parent must consent to the screening. Third, it mandates that the parent be provided a copy of the results. Fourth, the mental health screening may not use the results, may not, the results may not be used to make any decision relating to the student's instruction or academic opportunities or for student discipline. Fifth, it states explicitly that the mental health screenings must be maintained in accordance with the Data Practices Act and the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. Sixth, it calls for mental health screening data to be destroyed after the student's parent is notified of the results and resources available or 60 days from the date of collection, whichever is earlier. And lastly, it explicitly includes intermediate school districts and other cooperative units. Thank you, Representative Morrison. Members, any questions for the author on the A3 amendment? Seeing none, members, this is a voice vote. If you'd please unmute. All in favor of the chair's motion on the A3 amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Nay? Motion prevails. Representative. Morrison, to your bill as amended. Any further uh, introductory comments? Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I appreciate the opportunity to present House File 3634, a bill aimed at addressing the grower, growing mental health needs of our students. We knew that children's mental health challenges were rising prior to the pandemic, and they have only accelerated since that time. We can debate the reasons, but the fact is that our young people are needing more support than we are currently providing them. If there are any silver linings to the pandemic, one of them may be the growing destigmatization of mental illness and a recognition that mental health is health. Given that changing landscape and the clear need, now is the time to do everything we can to meet it. There's been much discussion about the deterioration of our children's mental health over the prior few years. I think we all agree that this is a challenge we must rise to meet. This bill provides a way to help identify those at risk and to connect them with the resources they need. As a reminder, I'd like to share some sobering statistics. Mental health emergency room visits among youth ages 12 to 17 increased 31% between 2019 and 2020. And in 2021, emergency room visits for suicide attempts was up 51% among girls in that same age range. Only a third of high school students felt they're able, feel they are able to cope with their sources of stress. One in three high school students and half of female students report persistent feelings of sadness or hopelessness. 
two thirds of parents report that their child has struggled with their mental health. And one third say their child's mental health is worse than before the pandemic. House file 3634 requires that school districts develop a plan to conduct mental health screenings on students in grades K through 12. If the results indicate a potential mental health condition, the district must notify the student's parent of the results and of resources available to the student in the school or community. The bill also bolsters student mental health supports in schools by making districts eligible to receive funds sufficient to fund two full-time mental health support staff positions for each 2,000 or fewer students. Mental health support staff positions include school psychologists, school social workers, school nurses, school counselors, and chemical dependency counselors. We have a generation of children who are living through unprecedented times and need extra support. Our kids are asking for our help and we must meet this moment for them and with them. We have to approach this crisis from many different angles. Asking them how they are and identifying those at high risk is a first step and then making sure they can access a mental health professional for a diagnostic assessment is the next step. What we cannot do is nothing. Our young people are struggling and we need to support them so they can become healthy adults. Their future and all of our futures depends upon it. Mr. Chair, I believe I have two testifiers here today. Um, one, a senior at Minnetonka High School and another medical student at the University of Minnesota who provided the idea and the inspiration for this bill. Very good, Representative Morrison, thank you very much. Let's start with that medical student. I have Christopher Prokosch, who's a medical student, as you said, at the university. Mr. Prokosch, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Christopher Prokosch and I'm a second year medical student at the University of Minnesota. And I'm working with Representative Morrison as a public health advocacy fellow. Before medical school, I worked for AmeriCorps College Possible in St. Paul, where I helped high achieving first generation high school students apply to college. During my year working with students, I witnessed some of the unique mental health challenges that adolescents face that were further exacerbated by shifting to online school as the pandemic began. I had students who were burdened as the primary caretaker for a handicapped parent, anxious about generating income for their family, and grieving the distance between themselves and their family on another continent. Some stressed about their lack of home internet access, others lost family to COVID-19. The pandemic increased screen time, decreased human interaction, and harmed students' mental health. The big question now is what are we going to do about it? Beginning mental health screening in early age in schools will both identify and care for those who are struggling and help youth across Minnesota understand the importance of prioritizing mental health. As a future medical professional, House File number 3634 is crucial to addressing the mental health challenges that students face and will serve as an important step in helping today's youth emerge from this pandemic to live fulfilling and healthy lives. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Prokash. Also on my list is Jin Bang, a senior at Minnetonka High School. Ms. Bang, please uh, state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Welcome to the committee. Pleased to have you here today. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Jin Bang, and I'm a senior at Minnetonka High School. And so I want to begin by saying that to some, school is their only source of, of a hot meal of its only source of a quiet space to think and work like I'm currently in during our school day, their only source to a trusted adult. So similarly, whether it's through health class or the counseling office, school is, is also a student's only access to mental health education and resources. And throughout my time as a student, I've learned that about the importance of mental health and clinical diagnoses like depression and anxiety, but I've never actually learned how to be tested or treated for any mental health illnesses in school or health class. Mental health concerns for my peers and I are often overlooked and are identified, if at all, too late. And mental health screening starting even from kindergarten will not only continue to ensure that students are mentally healthy, but will help identify and aid students who are struggling. So personally speaking, as a first generation immigrant, my family recognizes the importance of mental health and therapy, but we don't have the access or even know where to begin looking for a therapist. And so school is really where that resource comes in. And so whether it's from friend drama or the impacts of e-learning or major world events that's happening every day, I know that the only source of 
resource for my mental health is comes from school. And so I sympathize with students from schools who don't have the resources to shine a light on students' mental health. And so this bill would not only provide those resources to schools and struggling students, but also allow a direct line for administrators to assess and aid students' well-being. So I ask that you recognize our struggles, especially of those who already have an inequitable access to these resources and help pass this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bank. When this chair, excuse me, when this hearing was posted, the public was provided with instructions on how to sign up to testify during the public portion of this bill hearing. We received no requests from the public for testimony. Members, questions for Representative Morrison or the testifiers? Representative Daniels. Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, this is a finance committee and we are asking to take a vote on it today but we have no idea, at least I don't have any idea, uh, what the physical cost of this is. Um, I'm wondering if the author might have at least an idea of what it might be uh, the cost of this. Representative Morrison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Daniels. The, the fiscal note is not completed yet. And Representative Daniels, will be uh, recall that we will be sending this uh, off to another committee for further consideration, uh, and then it will be returned to this committee for uh, possible inclusion at a later time. Any okay, follow-up, Representative Daniels? No, not at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Representative Ewakim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to thank Representative Morrison for bringing forward this bill. Um, we've known for a long time and statistics show that children do struggle with mental health at an early age. And if we can get to the root of the problem or help them build the tools to be resilient, they go much further in life. You just have to look at some of the, the um, data that the Bar Institute has collected and building, um, building resiliency in children. And I, I kind of want to point out this kind of dovetails in what we were talking about in the last bill is children's health, both physical and mental go hand in hand when it comes to learning in school. It'd be just as hard to come into school having a mental health break as it would be to come in with the stomach flu or a toothache. And it's important for us to early on try to decide, try to decipher how we can best help our children where they're at. Um, there's an old massage saying that I I learned years ago when doing advocacy work around early children, early childhood is the community of the Messiah asks, how are the children? And that's a key indicator on how successful their community is going to be. And this is going to go a long way to making our children successful. And I just wanted to thank you. So there's not a lot of question in there, but just more of a comment. And um, to thank you to Mr. Prokosh for bringing this forward and this uh, student, um, uh, um, from Minnetonka for just being willing to come and speak about it. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Joachim. Representative Bennett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this uh, question I believe would be for the bill author, but I'm just curious if, so if a student is flagged through the mental health screening as having a mental health issue, um, what, what will then happen with that student? What happens with that data and who is able to see it or not see it. I'm gonna ask two questions here. And then the second one is, with the current shortage in mental health professionals, especially in rural Minnesota, um, and obviously, obviously this may drive the need for more, how, how will we handle this um, when the current needs aren't being met with, met with mental health issues? Representative Morrison? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Bennett, all really important and good questions. Um, I'll take the last ones first. I think we all certainly recognize the shortage and the need, both the shortage and the need um, for mental health professionals. Um, I am hopeful that, uh, for example, telehealth uh, could be helpful to some students as we look to find um, enough uh, care for the people in Minnesota who need it. Um, the SIPAC legislation that was passed last year um, may be helpful in addressing some of this. Um, and then to your earlier questions, uh, if I can remember them, um, the, the amendment, I think, addressed those, those concerns. Um, the, 
the data is private and it will be, um, first of all, it's a screening. So it's not diagnostic. It just flags kids who are at higher risk for developing a mental health problem. So they need to go on to have a further assessment. So the parent will be, will first of all, have to consent before the screening is performed. Um, and then they will be provided with the results. And then the results will be destroyed after 60 days or as soon as the, the child and the family are connected with resources, whichever one comes first. Um, I think that addresses all your questions, but let me know if I missed one. Representative Bennett, a follow-up? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks so much for that information. Uh, Representative Krisha, you are the last person on my list. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the bill out there. So, uh, and I'm going to actually direct my first question to Mr. Strom and our staff. Can you walk me through exactly how the revenue and the funding, what, what this will create? Because it, it looks like we're shifting away from um, a student-centered funding mechanism to a staff-centered with the, the staff quotas. Am I reading that correctly? Mr. Strong? Uh, Mr. Chair, if Representative Krisha could direct that question to Ms. Para for now. I'm having internet difficulties and only heard about a third of it. Ms. Para, can you get us uh, started on an answer to Representative Krisha's question? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair and members, uh, the bill um, funds positions, but the funding is based on the number of students. Um, so for every, um, I believe it's 2,000 uh, students, um, then there's a, the two positions are, are funded at the um, statewide average salary. Representative Krisha, does that help? That does. And so taking that back to the bill author. So to the bill author, you are looking at um, two staff per 2000s. How do we know that every district has the exact same need of two per 2000? Uh, it, what, what kind of data suggests that? Is that a where did you get that number? Representative Morrison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Krisha. Certainly, it's difficult to predict precisely what the needs in an individual district are, but we wanted to provide at least a baseline minimum for the students. Representative Krisha. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and to the bill out there. So, okay, so I understand that. So, obviously, it's difficult to get that number. So, then let me ask this. How do we know what we're actually trying to solve, and how will we measure when we've solved it? In other words, when we look at two school districts, <clears throat> How do we know which one has a certain level of mental health uh, that warrants two staff and how do we know another one that doesn't? And what I'm really getting to here is why we're taking that decision making away from the local uh, staff. Representative Morrison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Krisha. Um, I'm not sure how we're taking it away from the local staff, but I guess I would refer to MDE and how, uh, you know, how they would uh, make decisions about it going forward. Representative Tricia? Yeah, well, uh, so I mean, you're mandating a two staff per 2000. And are there other ways that we can support students with mental health rather than just testing them? That's, that's the basis of my question here. It seems like we're putting in a, hey, we need two staff per 2000 just to do testing, but we're really not getting to what's going to solve the issue uh, with some of the, the mental health challenges these students are facing. Representative Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Krisha. The, this, the mental health support staff are not being hired to perform the testing. They would be hired to support the students in the schools. Representative Krisha, does that clarify? Yes. Okay, so that, thank you, Mr. Chair. And so that begs the question, so why are we not basing our staffing base, the staffing needs based on recommendations that come out from the testing? In other words, if after doing the testing and screening, we de it's determined that a certain level is needed, why are we immediately mandating two per 2000? Representative Morrison. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Krisha. Uh, perhaps we would need to adjust it um, as time goes on, but I, I think there's abundant evidence already that we have a mental health crisis among our students. Representative thank Krisha. Oh, thank you, and, and, and I'm really not trying to put you on the spot. We're a finance community trying to, uh, just saying we have an abundant mental health crisis isn't quantitative enough to start to put staffing quotas on there. Uh, 
and and I won't go any further with my line of question. I'm just going to make some comments so we can keep moving and, and keep getting your timeline. But one of the challenges I see that we're facing right now with the mental health crisis, among other ones, is we're just using this as a catch-all for everything. Um, and a lot of the things that we don't really have our hands around and how we're going to solve them. For example, and as you take this forward, uh, Representative Morrison, some things that I'll ask you when you come back is children that get in the child protection system, they already have screenings. Children that are going through special ed, they already have screenings. We have lots of ways that we're screening our children already. And I'll just take the child protection system because I know that a little bit more, um, I'm a little bit more familiar with that. We, we're screening children. We already know a lot about them. We know a lot of what's happening and we're already providing resources for them. So I would be very wary of adding another um, set of another battery of tests and screening to these children who are already under an immense, a lot of, of screening. The other thing that um, I will bring up, and I think this is, you know, in, in some circles, it'll be fairly unpopular, but the reality is we don't just need mental health screening. We need to work on the non-cognitive skills of dealing with resiliency and getting through these. Um, one of the big things that I have advocated for many, many times is all kids go through challenges, all people go through resiliency, and we know that there are certain triggers of when that stress can hit very dangerous levels. The problem that we have is some children have a success or a safety network that they can go back through to get them. And it really becomes dealing with those challenges, that non-cognitive skill of problem solving, resiliency, and, and frankly, grit. I mean, there are times that we all go through things where we just have to figure out a way to get through what can be very difficult. Some children, some adults uh, don't do that well, and, and some don't have the skills. So the problems that I have with this bill are we're putting this all on a testing and we're putting it all on some arbitrary quotas, but what we're really not doing is we're not talking to the schools or we're not offering a school's a revenue stream that says, how can you solve it for your community and have some flexibility with that funding? Once again, uh, even in your own words, we're mandating a staff quota all the way down. And so at this point, members, I would, uh, I'll be voting no, I'll be recommending a no vote. I know it's going to judiciary and coming back. I think there's still some problems we need to solve and we need to quit using it's a problem as a way of just putting a revenue stream out there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Krisha. Rep Representative Morrison, that was a lot. Uh, do you wish to respond at this time? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Krisha. I, I appreciate your comments, and there's um, wisdom in 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 most of them. <laughs> um, I you know I I certainly don't intend to present this as the single solution to all of the challenges that our kids face. Uh, but this is a step that will be part of a broader effort. Um, and so I would just say, I hope you'll um, hang in there with me and, and consider consider changing your mind when, when the bill comes back to in front of this committee. Uh, Representative Krisha, while you uh, traditionally get the last uh, comment from the minority, Representative Erickson has raised her hand. So I'll let you two figure out any internal caucus tensions later. But Representative Erickson, I see you have your hand up. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And perhaps this is a question Representative Krisha wants to ask. I want the author to uh, tell us why the funding mechanism is based on staff salaries and the average of the salaries uh, instead of this being student-centered funding. Uh, explain why you've chosen the staff-centered because if the salary of the uh, professional increases, then that cost is going to increase and that could very likely happen because you're looking at averages. So uh, perhaps Representative Krisha wants to weigh in on this too. Uh, but thank you and I look forward to the answer from the author. Representative Morrison, your response. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Representative Erickson. I think Ms. Para um, answered that question. The the. The bill does fund positions, um, but the funding is based on the number of students. Um, the last thing, of course, we want to do is um, create an unfunded mandate for our schools. Ms. Para, do you have anything to add? Do you want to review that 
mechanism for us, please? Um, uh, that's accurate. The one thing I would add is the, is the funding isn't automatic. It's um, a district or, or charter school is eligible for the funding and they have to provide um, the, the commissioner certain information in order to receive that funding. That's helpful, thank you. Representative Erickson, any follow-up? I'll give it to Representative Krisha. All right, Representative Krisha, back to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you, Representative Erickson. My, my follow-up is really not a line of questioning. It's a comment you made, Representative Morrison, and that was actually extending the olive branch and saying that you hope you can earn our support. What, what I want to do is that has been a rare uh, type of quality that we've seen around here. And so I want to thank you for that. And what I would offer to you is this. While I don't necessarily agree that you have all the answers, I know where you're going with the bill. And we've talked on this side on the importance of this. And so what I would offer to you is take the comments that we offer to you as the constructive cons criticism that it is, that we're trying to find a way to move this forward. And if you bring it back with things that are better, uh, you'll earn that support. So thank you, Representative Morrison. Thank you, Representative Krisha. At this point then, uh, any closing comments, Representative Morrison? Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I appreciate uh, Representative Krisha's comments and look forward to um, working together. Um, I, I just, members, I ask for your support on this bill. This is not the be all end all. This will not solve all of the problems, but we need to begin to meet this moment for our kids. Uh, they're asking for our help. And so let's be there for them. This is one part of a solution. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Morrison. With that, Representative Joachim renews her motion to refer House File 3634 as amended to the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee. Mr. Lee, will you please call the roll? Thank you, Chair Daphne. Roll call voting on HF 3634 will now commence. Chair Daphne? Daphne votes aye. Chair Daphne, aye. Representative Sandstead? Aye. Representative Sandstead, aye. Representative Krisha? Krisha, no. Representative Krisha, nay. Representative Bennett? No. Representative Bennett, nay. Representative Daniels? Daniels votes no. Representative Daniels, nay. Representative Damith? Damith votes no. Representative Damith, nay. Representative Drefkowski? No. Representative Drefkowski, nay. Representative Erickson? Erickson votes no. Representative Erickson, nay. Representative Feiss? Aye. Representative Feiss, aye. Representative Jordan? Aye. Representative Jordan, aye. Representative Mark Court? Mark Court, aye. Representative Mark Court, aye. Representative Mueller? Mueller votes no. Representative Mueller, nay. Representative Richardson? Aye. Repres Representative Richardson, aye. Representative Thompson? Thompson, aye. Representative Thompson, aye. Representative Walgamot? Walgamot votes aye. Representative Walgamot, aye. Representative Shong? Aye. Representative Shong, aye. Representative Joachim? Joachim, aye. Representative Joachim, aye. Mr. Chair, I report we have 10 ayes and seven nays. Thank you, Mr. Lee. With, with a vote of 10 ayes and seven nays, Representative Morrison, uh, you are on your way to judiciary. Thank you for presenting your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Members, our last bill for today is House File 649 from our own Representative Sandsteed. It's our intention to lay this bill over by 11.55 a.m. Representative Sandsteed, would you like to make a motion to move House File 649 before the committee and to lay it over for further consideration and possible inclusion in a future omnibus bill? I would, so move, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Sandsteed. Before you introduce your bill, I understand you have an author's amendment. You would <laughs> like to offer to get the bill in the shape you'd prefer. I'll move the DE3 amendment to be before the committee to put the bill in the shape that the author prefers. Representative Sandsteed, with the amendment before us, would you like to uh, explain the amendment for us, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. The DE3 just makes primarily Technical changes, it shores up some continuity of language and it updates the fiscal request. Thank you very much. Members, any questions to the 
author's DE3 amendment. Seeing none, uh, members, this is a voice vote. All in favor of the chair's motion for the DE3 amendment, uh, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion prevails. Representative Sandsteed to your bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, House File 649 is a proposal. The House passed last session. Unfortunately, it did not make it into the final E-12 bill in June. And this bill as amended provides further clarity on the mission and execution of the concurrent enrollment teacher partnership. This partnership is the evolution of the 2017 pilot called the Northwest Partnership that was chief authored by then representative Bud Nornis. This partnership and program have been an effective response to credentialing challenge or credentialing challenge our secondary staff um, when seeking concurrent enrollment teaching opportunities. Specifically, the requirement to obtain 18 graduate credits in the content area for a concurrent enrollment course. The original $3 million pilot grant has been exhausted. A $375,000 annual base budget is in place for this program, but it is insufficient to meet the demand and uh, demand to readily close the remaining credit gap that exists. The amended bill calls for a $2 million one-time infusion available for three years to accelerate credit attainment <clears throat> across the state, shoring up our existing concurrent enrollment partnerships and positioning schools for more. At the end of the day, students and families are the winners as free college credits are available during the high school experience. And today, Mr. Chair, I have several testifiers who can talk to the specific work of this partnership. Thank you very much, Representative Sandstein. First on my list of testifiers is Drew Mons and students from Apple Valley High School. Mr. Mons, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Why don't uh, we give Mr. Mons, apparently he just uh, logged in, give him a, a couple of minutes to get settled. Uh, if we can, let's move to Jennifer Thompson, math teacher at McGregor Public Schools. Ms. Thompson, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Chair, she's also here. Um, I'll send her a note. Okay. While you're doing that, Ms. Burt, let's uh, see if Danielle Asplund, a teacher from Grand Rapids Public Schools, is available. Ms. Asplund? Hi. Yes, I'm here. Please thank you, and thank you for being here. Uh, <laughs> please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Danielle Asplund, and I'm a teacher at Grand Rapids High School up in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. Uh, and like many educators, when it came time for me to work on a master's degree, I took a long time debating on which route to take. And in the end, like many educators, I decided to get a master's in, uh, in education, in curriculum and instruction. Um, I figured that would be the best choice for me to make an impact on my students and make me a better teacher. Fast forward about five years after, um, I was offered the opportunity to teach a college in the school's writing course that would enable my students to earn three UMD um, college credits. And living in a rural community like we do, courses like this not only make a huge difference for students, but they also create a more equitable educational opportunity for them. When students are able to take advantage of all of our SITS offerings, they can leave our building with 32 UMD credits, which saves them over $15,000 in just college tuition alone. In addition, recent graduates of GRHS and their um, college in the schools writing experience or college in the schools experience report being better prepared for college after having taken these courses. However, in order to continue offering this great program for our students, we do need teachers with the required credentials. With a master's in education, I'd have to go back to school to earn my second master's degree, uh, although now as an adult with five kids at home that I have to support. Uh, so as someone who considers myself a lifelong learner, even I was debating on if I could swing the cost of a second master's degree. 
uh, enter the online 18 program where me and seven of my colleagues were able to take advantage of the program by taking up to 18 credits of graduate level courses in our content area in order to qualify as SITS professors. This program uh, allowed, or enabled our building to ensure that students would still be able to earn college credits all while staying in our building. Without this program, I'm sure that we would not be able to offer all the SITS courses that we are able to offer today. And as a teacher, I can confidently say that I truly want what's best for my students. And I know that many of my students, the SITS program is what fits their needs. I can also say that teachers are stressed and many just simply don't have the funds to take on a second master's degree on top of one that they're still working to pay off. There's approximately 820 teachers currently in our state that had their progress and credits interrupted by the pandemic. And on top of that, some disciplines like geography, for instance, has not even been represented in the program yet, which leaves some teachers in a difficult position of deciding if they can take on more student loans or if we have to cut a course that we know will benefit our students. Um, an expansion of this program would allow teachers to finish their 18 credits and allow more disciplines to be added. In a time when more teachers than ever are leaving the classroom, we need to do our best to support good teachers. So we in turn can continue to support our students. And uh, this online 18 program is one of those programs that does just that. Thank, Thank you. you, Ms. Asplund. I appreciate it. Uh, let's go back. Ms. Thompson, math teacher at the McGregor Public Schools, if you could please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can. Okay. My name, and sorry about the delay, I had eighth graders. <laughs> My name is Jennifer Thompson. I'm a math teacher in McGregor. McGregor is a small, very rural school with a very high I, it's very high poverty. And I teach classes all the way from pre-calculus to calculus. Um, so I teach every, every level. The 18 online program at MSU has allowed me to take three classes so far. And I have three left to take to be qualified to, to be certified. Um, I loved these classes. These classes have aided in my classroom teaching in all areas of mathematics, making me better able to answer the why question my students ask. And when I finish the program, it will allow me to teach college calculus. The classes are online and asynchronous, allowing me to continue teaching while enrolled. I would not have been able to take these courses due to financial restraints, but they were offered free through this program. I very much wanted to take to fi the final three classes, but funding was cut and the discounted rate was still unaffordable. Additionally, the extra compensation, compensation my district offers for teaching college in the schools classes won't even cover the cost of taking one credit. Um, most importantly, though, these courses help my students. In addition to helping me be a better teacher, being able to offer college um, calculus in my school would be a huge advantage. Being from a rural area, post-secondary options are not very accessible, and especially to our students. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Thompson. And I have to say, I had eighth graders. It might be the best comment of the day. So thank <laughs> you for that. Uh, Mr. Mons, Apple Valley High School, if you're uh, ready, please introduce yourself to the committee and proceed with your testimony. Yeah, thank you for having me. My name is Drew Mons. I'm the principal here at Apple Valley High School, uh, part of the Rosemount Apple Valley Egan system here. Um, Pleasure to have a chance just to be able to talk a little bit from uh, experiences that I had at a previous school um, and some of the work that we're trying to do here. Um, simply as others have noted, I just uh, underscore the fact that we can't offer these kinds of courses um, without the support of licensure programs and the support of the legislature and also of our school districts. Um, as some of the teachers noted, um, there's a real challenge for teachers to be able to get to that 18 plus. Um, and at uh, my previous school, in 2016, when we first started enrollment courses, uh, we reached our first threshold that year in really trying to tackle the equity uh, and achievement gaps that people like to focus on. But I really put that in talking about what are the aspiration gaps, the expectation gaps, and most importantly, the opportunity gaps that are there for many of our students. In 2016, we had 84% of the students at my previous school were part of a high rigor course that involved concurrent enrollment courses, AP classes, CIS classes, and articulated courses. So recognizing the importance of certificate programs, two-year programs, and four-year programs to make sure that we live up to our promise to our stakeholders, our students, and our families, to know that their kids are college and career ready. Um, these courses, uh, a lot of students don't see themselves in an AP class. Um, so the importance of being able to offer something like a CIS class or concurrent enrollment classes is huge you know, for kids in that majority middle. 
Um, by the time that I left in 2019, we'd gone from 84% of our students participating to 99%. Um, I found myself in this new school and in a new district, um, finding that we have a number of teachers that are interested, but they don't have, they have masters in education, they don't have those 18 credits. Uh, so to make sure that there are cash infusions that are there to be able to support and make that accessibility for teachers allows us to create those opportunities and accessibility for the students. An example of that that we have this year, uh, we have a first offering course partnered with the University of Minnesota. 44 of the students that started that course this year are former, um, are either current students who qualify for English language services or students who are on their monitor list. And at the point of just completing that as our trimester ended up last week, we had a 96% passing rate for those students. Uh, many of these students are now having the conversation about going to the University of Minnesota. They're talking about specific schools and they're looking specifically at Minnesota State Colleges and Universities because they know that those credits will transfer. Um, so I think, you know, we, we love the idea of a student getting an AA degree. Uh, we love the idea of transfer, but I think the most important piece is just making sure that every student has the opportunity to be able to take one class and know that they're successful in that at the high school level, because that gives them the confidence to go on to two and four year schools after this. Thank you, Mr. Mons. Next, M Matt Gross, Superintendent, Grand Rapids Public Schools. Superintendent Gross, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Hi, Matt Gross, Superintendent, Grand Rapids School District in Northern Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. The program, uh, like the one supported through this legislation, helps district meet the needs of students and families, as uh, explained by the, the, the staff and the faculty uh, so far testifying. It gives opportunities to students that can benefit from rigorous courses uh, and college credit. The credentials for teaching courses like this changed for many school districts a number of years ago when the Higher Learning Commission adjusted the credentialing requirements. And that left people like Danielle uh, from Grand Rapids in a spot where her master's degree was no longer uh, enough to teach the courses. So uh, programs like 18 Online or the one promoted here stepped into that gap and it made the courses that were required available it made the courses that were required accessible. And for schools in outstate Minnesota, we don't have the ability or teachers don't have the ability to go right down the street to take courses. They need courses that are accessible. Um, and third, it made the courses affordable, whether that was through the, the tuition reduction or the grants programs. In our district, this program and, and our courses benefit over 300 students that take college in the schools courses ranging from calculus to introduction to teaching. We know that there's a gap there for teachers and we feel like this is a great opportunity to help work on that gap. Uh, students in our Big Fork campus, small school 50 miles north of town, also benefit from college in the schools courses. And so that's a great opportunity for a very, very small rural school, again, because courses are accessible, uh, available and affordable. We work with our uh, through our collective bargaining to uh, support teachers that already have their master's degree uh, so that if there's not a lane change possibility that there's not a financial barrier to them. And, uh, you know, for our students and I think uh, uh, our principal that just spoke did a great job of laying out the benefits to kids. We the tuition savings is a clear and obvious one. Um, I think there are more. He talked about the transfer of credits, which is great. Um, I also think that giving kids the opportunity to explore college and high school is a great opportunity for students. And one of the things that I think is most important, but not talked about a lot is for students for uh, are coming from families that uh, may be the first time, they may the, be the first one going to college, being able to take college courses and experience college from a teacher that they know and trust and that they know cares about them really increases the likelihood of a success. I think you, you could see from the teachers on our uh, the, the panel here this morning that our students would be very, very uh, taken care of in those spots. And I think their, their likelihood of success would be increased. So it's a win, win, win all the way across the board. Appreciate your support. Thank you, Superintendent Gross. Last on my list is Jeremy Kovash, Executive Director of the Lakes Country Service Cooperative. Mr. Kovash, welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Jeremy Kovash, uh, Executive Director of Lakes Country Service Cooperative, testifying today in support of House File 649. We are the project administrator. As a project administrator, our, our job is to work with our higher education partners to ensure content areas 
and cost affordability, as you've, as you've heard from our uh, uh, testifiers uh, this morning. So we've worked with uh, Minnesota State University, Moorhead. We've worked with the Office of Higher Ed and other institutions uh, uh, for cost affordability, and we'll continue to do that should this legislation pass. Secondly, we work with our secondary school district partners all across Minnesota to ensure enrollment integrity. You heard Ms. Aspen testify that she is teaching these courses. You heard Ms. Thompson of McGregor testify that she and her district aspire to teach these courses. Uh, each of their school administrators in Grand Rapids and McGregor um, approve them for enrollment, advocating that they are teaching or will be teaching concurrent enrollment courses. Our goals, uh, number one, are to establish access for concurrent enrollment educators across Minnesota in as many subject areas as possible. And number two, to infuse additional funding to allow us greater opportunities, greater capacity, and access for more concurrent enrollment teachers in high need and additional subject areas. Members of this committee, you can be proud of the bipartisan investments made in this program. The impacts on students as reported by the Minnesota Department of Education and the rigorous course taking report shows that our students earn uh, well over 200,000 credits per academic year. As Principal Mons testified, the greatest increases to participation in these courses are students of color, English language earners, special education students, and low income students. Concurrent enrollment programs allow students, as uh, Mr. Gross testified, to allow a chance to remain in their high school programs with their teachers and peers while earning credit at Minnesota colleges. The College and High School Alliance and the Level Up Coalition released a report just this month, last month, entitled Unlocking Potential, which is a comprehensive set of policy recommendations for states looking to expand equitable access to college and high school programs. Our program addresses access and availability across Minnesota's diverse communities and student landscape. Moving forward, House File 649 will allow us to sustain current enrollment course offerings into the future. The bill will continue to secure the ability of our high school teachers and their higher ed partners to maintain a growing and robust portfolio of concurrent enrollment course offerings for our students. Thank you for your consideration and support and I will stand for questions. Thank you, Mr. Kovash. Member questions? Represent Representative Erickson, I see you have your hand up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My question is for the author. But first, first a comment. Um, you know, this program uh, started under uh, former Representative Nornis and with uh, help from Representative Loon. Uh, so this has been an important measure for us to take. Uh, and, and you know, when I was going through my teacher preparation program, uh, we had to major in our content area if we planned to get licensed in a secondary a level of teaching. Uh, you know, and that was really a good move. So Representative Sandsteed, my question is, have you talked to the teacher prep programs to find out why they are not encouraging or requiring uh, their candidates who uh, expect to teach and get licensed in the secondary area to take more content courses? because I easily qualified because I had far more than 18 credits in my major area. Uh, so have you had those conversations with teacher preparation programs so that we are alerting those candidates to the fact that if you wanna teach a concurrent enrollment course, you need to be prepared for it. Representative Sandsteed. Thank you for that question. Representative Erickson, the answer is no, I personally have not been in contact with the teacher preparation programs, but I do know that um, many of the decisions that are made re regarding um, what is offered through concurrent enrollment or what districts are doing are being done at a local district level. They are making the decisions, whether it's a writing course or calculus course or so on. Representative Erickson. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Sandsteed. Uh, I'm gonna to talk to the prep programs again, because I've done this before, uh, to remind them to uh, encourage, or as I said, even require more content courses, uh, because the, the variety that you can uh, accomplish in a, in a college program is really great. And I think it could address almost all of the uh, courses that are taught presently in concurrent enrollment and those that are, may come in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Erickson. Representative Draskowski, I see your hand. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, this is the third bill in a row where we've seen additional spending coming forward. I, I just want to make sure that I didn't forget something, but um, Mr. Chair, is a budget set for the biennium ready between now and June 30th of 2023? You know, Mr. Uh, Representative Draskowski, uh, the GOP yesterday on the floor made uh, a strong argument that no, the budget was not set uh, for the biennium and that we needed significant state funding in terms of uh, tax relief for major Minnesota corporations. So I'm hearing from the GOP that no, the budget was not set uh, and is available for amendment and modification. Well, Mr. Chair, that's not uh, that's not my been my observation. My observation is the budget is completely set uh, for the biennium, and we are seeing people bringing bills from all different directions for all different ideas during a time when we should actually be focusing on other things, policy areas, um, uh, figuring out how to flatten the fear uh, out of this pandemic and get back to normal. Instead, we have bills that come and continue to pile on and take more of the people's money to chase um, things that are perceived and not even proven uh, to be uh, answers or uh, causes of, of certain things. Um, I continue to grow my frustration with, uh, with this. This is, uh, this, is, this, is, this is bloating government. Um, this is not a deliberative way to do this. This should be done during the budget period. Uh, and that begins, Mr. Chair, next year. So I appreciate the discussion. Uh, many of these are good ideas, uh, but they should happen during a budget year and not uh, simply pile on with more and more spending like the Democrats appear to want to do here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Draskowski. Representative Ewakin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I don't know if this is a question for one of the testifiers or the author, but if I can remember right from our discussion around this last year, these 18 content course credits was something that the HCL um, brought up at the last minute, or maybe I'm getting the acronym wrong, HLC at the last minute. And this is a change that we really do need to make sure we're helping, um, helping our teachers be able to provide these important college and the school programs that by the way, give a lot better access for kids for secondary ed than post PSEO does because it's on campus and they don't have to find a way to get to an offsite location. Representative Joachim, thank you for that. You, you will recall that the uh, Higher Learning Commission is a private uh, organization with no uh, means of accountability. There's not a public appointee process for uh, who's appointed to the governing board of it. Uh, and it is uh, we tried, uh, Representative Erickson was part of this, I was a part of this, others, Representative Nornis, former Representative Nornis, as she uh, indicated earlier, a number of us tried to uh, get a rational response out of the Higher Learning Commission. And uh, I don't know about, I won't speak for Representative Erickson, I still have a little leftover frustration uh, from that experience, because I, as I said, a private organization that's unaccountable. Uh, Representative Sandsteed, uh, do you have any response uh, to that? To Representative Joachim? Thank you, Mr. Chair. My recollection is that yes, this is essentially a change from the HLC. Um, and this is, you know, put into effect uh, at the end of the day again, just for the betterment of our students to be able to provide them with additional opportunities. Thank you very much. Members, any further questions for the author or testifiers? Seeing none, Representative Sandsteed, any uh, closing comments? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, you know, uh, the state of Minnesota currently has a surplus. Um, and this is one way we could use some of those dollars for some of our uh, strongest students across the state of Minnesota to provide them additional opportunities by keeping them in their home school district, uh, which is beneficial to those uh, districts instead of having the funding leave their schools. So uh, just something to consider. I certainly appreciate the opportunity to talk about this program, to keep the student or the teachers that are in that pipeline, uh, to give them the ability to continue to finish and then to continue to offer, the, or offer those opportunities to our, our highest learners, our, our brightest students across the state 
and hopefully encourage them to continue with an ongoing education. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Sandsteed. And with that, Representative Sandsteed renews her motion to lay over House File 649 as amended for possible inclusion or for further consideration at a later date. With that, members, I will see you tomorrow. We are adjourned. <laughs>